How's it going? Hey, how's it going? How are you guys? Yeah, very good. Thanks. And yourself? Good to meet you, Kelsey. Good. It's good to meet you guys. Cool. Yeah, How, awesome. How's your day going? It's good. Yeah? It's good. What time is it? Where where you guys are? So, so I'm in down in Australia. So it's early five o'clock in the morning. And, oh, good uh, morning. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm in London, so it's eight p.m. tonight. So I'm, um, I'm super impressed. Bye. Oh, oh, thanks. By you guys coordinating timing and by your freaking homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're my people. <laughs> yeah, because we were, we were like, we were actually in Madrid at, at the time when we first spoke about it. And we were like doing this pub, pub crawl and uh, having these like amazing conversations just with our buddies. And we were like, wow, it'd be so cool if we like recorded this conversation because I bet you there's so many people that would be like, like to listen to it or would be saying, the same things with their buddies and you know their conversations that they have and then that was what kind of sparked it and then like craig said timing was everything and literally i think three years later almost we we kind of started so good afternoon kelsey abbott uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the ridiculously human podcast uh, we are super excited to have an awesome chat with you today I'm so excited to be here. That's so cool. So, so I swear, Michael O'Brien introduced us uh, from memory. And honestly, I have, we have so much to thank Michael. We're probably going to have to start paying him like a fee. He just introduces us to so many people uh, to have his guests on our podcast. So, you know. He's an amazing connector. I'm so grateful for him. He's such a role model of generosity and connection. Yeah, he yeah. totally is. Yeah, I definitely couldn't agree more. Um, I met him uh, through the Alt MBA that Seth Godin runs and it was just like, you know, he's just been amazing ever since then and uh, just like turned into a friend for both of us, which is so cool. Um, and actually, which is also very interesting, this world has funny ways of converging, but um, I listened to you on Brian Falchuk's uh, podcast, uh, just kind of as part of our research in that. And we're actually launching the podcast a podcast with brian this week he was our guest and um craig and i are going on his podcast tomorrow night so it's like it's kind of it's weird. <laughs> and it's weird. how did you meet brian did you meet him through through michael? obi through yeah. michael as well yeah <laughs> i introduced them oh did you classic yeah. well oh really so we're all connected we're all in it intertwined yeah exactly, That's so exactly. Cool, man. <laughs> and then there was also claude silver who was like we also had this weird sort of connection that we had heard her on Brian's podcast and OB had connected us. So it is really intertwined. And uh, that's one of the themes that, of Brian's podcast actually, which is pretty cool. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I haven't listened to it yet. I don't like to listen ahead of time because I, mm. I just love surprises. Okay. Totally. Cool. Total weirdo <laughs> like that. And, but do you listen to podcasts that you're on, like after you've been on them? Sometimes I did once, <laughs> like actually just once. Um, I don't think I listened to the one with Brian. I think in fact, that one, I told my husband, I was like, I feel like there was something I said that was awkward. Can you listen to this and tell me it was, if it was any good? And he listened to it when he was driving across the state or something. It was like, I have no idea what you thought was awkward. The whole thing was good. Uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. We have these, it's, as I think all of us as humans, we have this like way of replaying things through our heads after they're done going, oh, what was that okay? Like, did I say the right thing and whatever? Um, the other day I did this talk uh, at this company and then, you know, I, th I know the talk went well and then they asked questions afterwards. And then, but then that night I couldn't get to sleep because I kept on playing these questions through my head going, how did I actually answer that? Did I answer it like this or that? And I was just like, <laughs> it was so stupid. You know what I mean? But it was probably okay at the time. <laughs> but it's probably actually a sign that you were in flow. Possibly. So if we, when we don't remember things, it means we're in flow. And then everything that's coming out of our mouth is completely brilliant. Yeah. yeah that's cool. that's what yeah. I tell myself. Yeah. yeah. No, I like this. It's a really cool way to look at it instead of looking at it in like a way of like, oh, I've forgotten what I was saying just like I, I nailed it and that's why I was in that why I can't actually recall all of it which is really cool yeah. like when you drive to work you don't remember every corner or turn you've taken you just arrive at work and you're like oh how did I get here because you're in that driving flow state so that's yeah it's a cool analogy I love it 
yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so Kelsey, um, it sounds like you were a little bit of a, a shy kid uh, when you were growing up and you also had a few learning disabilities. Uh, maybe you can just take us back to your childhood and you know, tell us what you correct, uh, recollect of those early days. Yeah, I was a shy kid. I was, you know, I've been thinking about this recently and I think, I don't think I was necessarily shy with other kids, but I did not, maybe trust isn't the right word, but I was super shy around adults. And that's because, you know, the messages I was getting from adults wasn't always uplifting or encouraging. So I didn't want to be seen by adults. I would hide from adults and then yeah i was diagnosed with learning disabilities in first grade and given a tutor i guess the tutor told my parents that i'd never go to college and that tutor then at some point became a nutritionist and my dad went and met with her and was like oh yeah well kelsey just graduated with her master's by the way (laughs) um but i asked my parents after first grade excuse me, to take me out of tutoring because I didn't like how it was pulled out of class because it felt I already, I was slow to learn to read, excuse me. And I just, you know, I felt like an other. All right, so wait, let's back up. My first grade class, we're six years old, but apparently we were not expected to be the brightest crayons in the box because they split us into the panda bears and the unicorns. We weren't supposed to know that one group was super smart and special and the other wasn't. This panda bear had it figured out that <laughs> unicorns were all sparkly and shit. And I was just like cute and roly poly. <laughs> so I was already in first grade, like, well, I'm already, I'm a panda bear and all my friends are unicorns. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not good enough. And then I was getting pulled out of class for tutoring. So I'm really not good enough. So (laughs) that was the start of my, my experience with learning disabilities. And, um, I learned, I eventually found some teachers who spoke to me like a human. I think that was the difference. And, and then in, in college, I revisited learning disabilities and figured some out like, oh, I had this processing disorder where I took this class called um, abnormal psychology. And the professor would present material from a scientific paper and then ask questions immediately. And I, every time she'd call on me, I was like, I don't know. Like I couldn't process the information that quickly. I feel like, can, can he ask me tomorrow? Can you give me at least an hour? like five minutes at least without you talking. Like I just was taking the information in and just couldn't quite turn it around. Um, And I just quick, it's no, it's a very small soapbox, but I really don't think the word disability is as accurate. It's just Mm. learning differences. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Yeah. It's actually so interesting. Um, I went to lunch with a friend of mine today he was my old school teacher, actually. We also had him on the podcast, Sean Fox, and he was talking about his nephew, and his nephew also has learning difficulties. And they went and did all these tests and stuff, and basically found out that he he listens really well to questions, and he almost needs to hear a question to answer it. So actually, in school exams, he has someone who reads the question to him before he answers it, because if he if he reads it himself. For some reason, he doesn't process it, which I thought was really, really interesting. Like, and um, they actually have people who do that. They go into exams with kids to ask the questions, like you know, like speak them out, and then the kid answers it, which is great. That's which is interesting. an amazing thing that they offer. Yeah, that makes sense because so people listening to this podcast are probably at least lean towards auditory learning. Then there are people who are going to watch videos. Yeah, not me. If I'm watching a video, I don't have the screen visible. I'm listening to it. And then, you know, then there's reading. There's, and and there's learning kinesthetically, which is definitely my dominant form of learning. But I I think we all know by the time we're adults, our preferred learning style. So it makes sense that a kid would be really dominantly auditory learner Mm, at a young age. How cool that he already knows. 
Yeah. I mean, if it's good enough for adults, it should be the same for children. And, and also there's so many other things like when, like what you said, being called a disability, what about the diet? What about the sleep? What about the home environment? There's so many other factors. And sometimes to just like, you know, put, go down that path of having a feeling like you have a disability is, is not always empowering. I know it's not always easy for teachers. I can imagine too, um, just uh, in their defense, but, um, they are definitely, uh, way more factors involved than just, you're not a great learner. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I've uh, definitely seen that in my work as well. Um, in terms of their nervous systems and I mean, diet obviously is a massive thing, but I'm not saying in your case, but for many children, it certainly is. So, so talking about, you know, learning and reading and stuff, you, 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 as you mentioned, you were a little bit sort of a late, uh, reader, let's say. And, um, and one of the times all the kids actually clapped in the class after you, um, started to read something and, and you actually really felt mortified because you thought it was a bit of a pity party, isn't it? Yeah. So in our first grade classroom, at least all the panda bears were supposed to learn to read and to read aloud. <clears throat> and so I read a dog on a log, which I think was the, the story was something like a dog is on a log <laughs> and the log has a dog. on. I don't know. I don't think it was very extensive or very interesting. I was the last kid to go. So I'm shy, I'm not kind of iffy about teachers and I'm slow to learn to read. And then I'm the last kid up there. I'm like not feeling good about myself. And I read the whole thing out loud and then everybody clapped. And whether they clapped because they were finally, like it must've been painful for the teachers. But oh, so if they clapped because they were finally done, listening to Kelsey read and all of the students reading, or if it was just like, oh, the last kid that just finished the race. Good job, kiddo. Mm. But I interpreted it as a pity clap. And that is my first solid memory of what I call my gremlin or inner critic, which used to tell me, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. So the story I got like already being a panda bear, being pulled out of class for learning disabilities for tutoring and then being the last kid to go and the kid get, that gets the pity clap. I was like, I am so not worthy. And I carried that story with me for another more than 20 years before I transformed it through coaching. Wow. wow. It's uh, it's yeah. It's amazing how, what a massive impact these uh, it's small things in uh, you know inverted commas um, have on us throughout our, our whole lives, and and it sort of hold us back basically you know from from so many from so many things and being our genuine and best self. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, it's it's also funny to me it, what we remember. Mm. One of the really powerful stories we remember. When I first visited that school that I went to for first grade, I didn't go there for kindergarten. And I remember visiting the kindergarten class. And I remember like wearing a, a cute outfit. This is the 80s. So like, <laughs> you know, putting thought into the clothes with my mom and figuring out the shoes. And then they had gym class. And all the kids were supposed to put sneakers on. And the kindergarten teacher started yelling at me. This is my recollection that she started yelling at me to put my sneakers on and I didn't have sneakers and mm. I bawled. I was crushed. I was terrified. I was, I was like crumbled into a mess. Like it, I still, I can feel the sadness and horror of that little girl when, as I tell you the story. Oh, man. It's devastating. So you, were, so you were like totally amped for this moment you put all the effort in and still you will let yourself down and and it, it, i guess this is part of that evolution of that critic inside of you like ha, is it done correctly have i done this correctly i don't want to feel that feeling again well actually wait this is really interesting so it wasn't for me it wasn't about doing it correctly it was about i had worn the clothes i was supposed to wear i was doing what i was quote unquote supposed to do i was being a I don't want to say, I'm going to say good girl, but not in a behavior sense. But like I was, I wasn't lifting my dress above my head, which I did a lot as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, I was wearing the fancy shoes. I was doing what I was supposed to do. And then I was wrong. 
and mm. doing what I was supposed to do to this day, I'm hugely anti should don't, mm. I really truly believe that that word should be outlawed. Don't should on yourself. Don't should on other people. And I had done what I should do. And then to have it like find out that it was, it was quote unquote wrong. That's what was so devastating for me. It was mm. wrong. I was different. I wasn't worthy. They wouldn't let me go to gym because I didn't have the right shoes. Oh man. Yeah. Talk about just lay, laying you down really hard and a, just a young little girl. Like it's actually really sad. It's the little story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, if you'd grown up in South Africa, you would have been like one of the sort of, you know, uh, popular girls because none of us at school actually wore shoes really. So <laughs> I would have been <laughs> in, yeah, it's all about it. <laughs> I'm usually, I'm anti foot prisons. No, I put prisons. I love yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, totally. Like right now, no ways, no shoes on. That's for sure. <laughs> no, no shoes on over here either. Cool stuff. Cool. <laughs> so, um, it, you also were like a really uh, sporty little girl, and um, you started swimming at the age of nine, and um, swimming was a big part of your life, and I can totally relate to that. It was a massive part of my life as well. Um, however, you uh, before that, you actually had tried a few other things uh, like ballet. Uh, jazz and gymnastics is that right yeah yeah so I'm just shy of six feet so gymnastics didn't it didn't really work out for me I <laughs> loved it I loved every part about it I feel like maybe that's when I really like found my way into my body and was totally at home and then they're like yeah you're a little tall mm -hmm. my best friend at the time she had moved away to to Connecticut and she, the pictures of us from our childhood are a little bit mortifying because <laughs> I was like a foot and a half taller than her. And she was a couple months older than me. And it's just, I'm sure it's embarrassing from her perspective too, but I can't see it from that perspective. I just see it from like the, oh my God, I'm huge and <laughs> tower over her. But I tried, I tried ballet which and jazz. I tried the dancing thing. That was fun. I liked it. I didn't love ballet. I loved jazz, um, loved gymnastics. And then I announced to my parents, I was a voracious reader. I was the kid that would read the cereal box just because mm -hmm. something to read. Cool. Um, so I read the YMCA, the like, I don't know, the programs guide that came in the mail. And I told my parents I wanted to join the swim team. And they were like, really? Okay. So I went and tried out for the swim team and I, I had no idea what I was doing. I had seen big kids swim. So I was eight turning nine and I had seen the big kids swim at the summer club. So I'd seen butterfly. And I remember them saying, if you, even if you've seen butterfly, I want you to do it. So I did dolphin dives because that's what butterfly looked like to me. And I, I made the, the white team, which was, you know, I, this is like the late 80s and I don't even what are those the caps are made out of they're like lycra caps um <laughs> not even the silicone ones no no this oh, no is, no this is like <laughs> lycra caps uh <laughs> that part is short-lived thank god <laughs> horrible and then and yeah we practice like twice a week and I fell in love with it. I made the best friends ever. And I kept swimming. I swam this morning. I mean, I kept swimming my entire life. And I felt at home in the water. Apparently as a kid, you know, I talked about being shy around adults, not in the pool. Mm -hmm. I would like, eat, starting from a super young age, as soon as I was in water, my parents said they couldn't get me to shut up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was my home. And, and I had a super beginner mindset. I see that now, obviously, in swimming, which I really, I think of my 12 year old self a lot as an athlete now. And I look back at how I remember doing a few races when I was 12, which was like my breakthrough year and um, qualifying for big meets. And I was like, they were like, oh, you qualified for age groups. And I was like, cool. What's that? Like, I had no <laughs> idea. All these people were trying to make these cuts. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> You know, I'm you just, just it. Yeah. It's crazy. Isn't it another example of, you know, with, with kids, like you tried so many different things and you eventually found the one. And, and it's another example of kids maybe 
they should show their creativity, wear your different shoes, try different things because they eventually you'll come across something that suddenly, wow, look how she's thriving now. And it's not because of any other reason than you just weren't in that space where you felt like you had that spark. And, you know, sometimes you just have to find that thing and maybe you just haven't found that thing yet. And that's a really yeah. interesting list. And that reminds me of a story actually from college. We, the swim team taught swim lessons to the kids of the faculty, staff and students. And I remember, I think it was my first year. And they were like, oh, Kelsey, you can have Jack. And I was like, okay, cool. They're like, he is a bit of a problem child. And they're like, he's a total ADD kid. And I don't think I knew then that I'd been, that I had ADHD, but I was like, cool, up for the challenge. Jack and I had a blast. <laughs> like he was just like, okay, what do you want to do now? What do you want to do now? What do you, they kept teaching us to tell the kids to extend their arms being like, reach for ice cream. You know what I did? I said, Jack, what's your favorite food? And he said, broccoli. And so we reached for broccoli and everyone's like, how'd you get Jack to reach? I'm like, well, we're reaching for broccoli, not ice cream. Hmm. He's super excited about that. And we, you know, we just practiced jumping for a little while and then we'd practice blowing bubbles and then we'd do some swimming and then we'd jump again. And then we'd, we were just moving around the whole time. And he just needed, he just needed to follow the joy. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, so it's, it's amazing how like someone just by purely listening to someone else for a little bit longer and asking the right questions and then saying that one line, you can really sort of just change, you know, the whole sort of trajectory of someone's kind of life or outlook. And um, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Just ask questions. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny. I remember at school, I used to be super busy as well and I couldn't sit still. And then eventually like the teachers moved me to a desk on my own because we used to sit with in pairs on the desks and everyone like, I can't handle this. And, and it made me also feel so horrible. But like you say, it's just because I had energy, I wanted to do stuff. And when you found the people that were like you and you were also high energy and, do, and like busy, suddenly like you actually you thrive, you know what I mean? But except mm -hmm. when you have to conform, as you were saying earlier, and should, you should sit still when you're listening. I, I listened better when I was like active and, you know, and not just Me sitting too. like the, the, the church mouse in the back. So it's yeah. just interesting how you have to find what sort of resonates with, 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 with yourself, you know? Yeah. But always, always meetings that my, my short lived career in like a quote unquote real job before I went on my own Anytime we had to have a meeting, I was like, walk outside. <laughs> yeah. We can great. do the block and get everything yeah. done. That was my okay. preferred way. Mm -hmm. That's cool. a great way to have a meeting, actually. Great idea. Because I yeah, think a meeting, meeting room must be the most st stuffy, Ugh. most like stifling in terms of productivity thing that you could probably do, you know? Yeah. When I, so, so I'm going to jump ahead in the chronology now. <laughs> I, so when I worked, I worked for the government as a marine biologist and I remember the dawning realization. Dawning makes it sound like it was slow. It wasn't that slow. I remember the realization when I realized everyone else, they like this. They're made for this. I like, I, I love marine biology. But being in a cube and doing environmental impact assessments and all of this stuff and all of these regulations, I feel like I'm trapped. And mm. it was, I had just taken a, like an online Myers-Briggs test. Hmm. I figured out, you know, I'm an ENFP. We are not supposed to be in cages. I'm also an ENFP. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so, so, I mean, talking about you when you were younger, in college, um, it was also somewhat of a, com a confusing time for you. Um, you were a great athlete and you met your now husband, but you also felt different and that you stood out there, didn't you? I, so I didn't meet my husband until after college. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Um, so. I stood out everywhere. Like I said, I'm almost six feet. My wonderful roommate in high school I was 6'3", and that was a, a fabulous time in my life because I wasn't the tall girl. Um, I've always, I don't fit in boxes. 
And I tried a lot at the time. I would see how other people were doing it and they seemed to be following this path. This like, wow, it's like somebody made a path for them and they're just walking step to step and it seems super easy. I'd be like, I'm going to try that. I would last an hour max and then be like, never mind. I'm back to doing it my way. But, but it's, it's probably quite interesting because... It- I'm sure people that uh, were your friends or, or that knew you, they probably almost like had no idea because they looked at you like, wow, you're the star athletes. You probably, you were probably quite confident, like outgoing towards them. And um, they probably looked up to you because of everything that you were. And is that, is that your kind of understanding of it at all? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> so they, 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 they knew you were a bit awkward or what, what do you mean? Um, well, I don't, I don't think of myself as a star athlete at all. Not one little bit. I was a swimmer in college. I was in high school. I swam and I played water polo and was a better water, water, polo, water polo player than I was a swimmer. Um, and then college, we had, a, uh, we had a co-ed club. It was fun-ish for a little while, but as one of the only women who knew how to play, it, I thought the guys would, on other teams would just try and beat the crap out of me or just grab my hand and hold it under the water. And I have super tiny wrists and I could not get my hand back. Um, so that was fun for like a year because there was another guy who knew how to play and then that was fun. Um, but then, then I tried to start a women's water polo club and that didn't go so well. We really had to fight for pool time and yeah, so I don't think of myself as a star athlete in college at all. <laughs> okay, okay. But, uh, but anyway, talking about water polo, water polo is a, a super cool sport, isn't it? That was like, for me as well, swimming and water polo, like water polo was a, was a thing. And um, there's some seriously dirty tactics that go on underneath the water. I remember a lot of that stuff. <laughs> yes, a lot, a lot, a lot of dirtiness. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The amount of like scratches and torn cozies, like costumes and stuff was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah yeah there were those um the zip up suits mm. they could wear for water polo which were a little i don't know stronger and, and a little like- stronger and there was the time of the speedo i think it was speedo had those hologram suits which were actually really scratchy mm. so they were like sandpaper so when you i played hold the and sometimes hole and that just meant you're leaning up against the person's suit and if they're wearing one of those suits you're like, this hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so talking about swimming, uh, there was a, there's a story about you in like one of your college swim meets, and basically I can really like you know relate to the story. You were you were swimming in the race and um, you were winning like after the first lap, and you noticed that you were winning, and something inside you just caused you to kind of slow down a little bit, and basically ended up touching you know second, came in second at the end of the race. And it's not because, uh, I don't know, you, I don't know, I don't know exactly why you kind of slowed down, but you said, but one of the reasons was like, you were just terrified of winning. And yeah, remember I talked about that inner critic from first grade that you're yeah. not worthy. Mm-hmm. I carried that with me, but it showed up in interesting places. So now when I'm coaching people, I remind them that our gremlins are inner critics. I use those words interchangeably they get loudest right before we do something really, truly awesome. Mm. So here I am. And, and let's put a little more color on this. It was the 50 free, 50 yards. This mm. race in college would take me like 23 seconds. Mm. This is how crazy our brain can get in 23 mm. seconds to like working yeah. my butt off, like just going balls to the wall, trying to go as fast as possible to, and I, you know, the, the thoughts weren't, conscious but to the like oh crap i'm winning i don't i'm not like so it wasn't slow enough to be like i'm not worthy of winning Mm -hmm. but there was a thought of i'm not worthy of winning i'm not a winner i'm a i'm here for the depth like i'm fast but i'm not the fastest Mm -hmm. and And i didn't recognize that that that's Mm -hmm. what had happened until years later Mm. Wow. Do you think people have this like as a, is it almost like a default for some people that they in like, it will hold them back in life and in other things as well. 
like that they yeah. they're just not they just have this sort of self deprecating side to them and is it because they're scared of of what will happen when you win or is it just or is it the fact that you not literally just don't think you are worthy worthy of it for me it was i don't think i'm worthy of it and there's something i haven't totally figured this out but something about standing on a podium already being the tallest it felt awkward to stand on top of the podium i've completely transformed all of this for fyi i like <laughs> being on top of the podium um, <laughs> but we all have inner critics mm. we create these when we're little kids as a way to protect ourselves so what i was hearing from adults in my life was you're not worthy you're not good enough so what i started telling myself is i'm not worthy so that then when I heard it from them, no big deal. I already know it. Mm. So our so, inner critics always say something like, you're not worthy. You're too tall. You're too fat. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. You're not brave enough. Whatever it is. And, and it, it's this completely backwards way to protect ourselves. If we are already telling ourselves we're fat and then somebody else tells us our fat, we're fat, no problem. I already mm. know that. You can't hurt me because I already knew that. So, totally. so who were these adults that were telling you you're not worthy? It was uh, my aunt and my grandparents. Hmm. Yeah. Like just sort of like uh, snide comments or, or, you know, like continuously I take it. It's like, you know, okay, uh, that's really yeah. tough. Yeah. And it, I didn't realize how much I had internalized it until re within the last year, I was like, oh, that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. It was somebody actually telling me, I didn't just make it up. Hmm. Totally, yeah, have I can I, been, I totally, yeah. okay. So I was just wondering, have you ever been able to confront them uh, at all? Or like, is it not something you want to no. get? No, no, I don't need to. My grandmother passed this year and she, she was 93 or just mm -hmm. shy of 93 when she passed. And her last five years, she got dementia and mm. she was really happy and joyful and loving. Mm. And wow. so I was able to have a relationship with her like that, which was, so I had that memory. And when she passed, I was able to, I wrote her a thank you note, you know, mm. and obviously I didn't send it anywhere, but also saying, I'm, I, I'm so happy that you're going to be free from pain. There's just mm. so much that she wasn't able to talk about. So. Mm. Wow. And did you, I mean, were you aware of the fact that, that they were saying blatantly sort of tough words to you, or was it more that your filter or your lens through which you heard the words, or was it a bit of both? I think it was a bit of both. I remember being, like I said, some adults being like, I don't like them, but mm. not really knowing why. And I think that like, I now know I'm super intuitive. So I think that's what it was, but I didn't know what to do with it. So I was like, bad energy, mm. but I don't and have do that use, language. <laughs> do you use intuition now a lot in your life? Yeah. I'm finally starting to own it. Yeah. I've gotten really way? into human design. Are you guys familiar with human design yet? No, no. Right. So, so human design is like this it was it came about in the 80s i think and i just learned about it six months ago and it took me a couple of months and i'm now like all the way down the rabbit hole in it and fascinated by it and it explains so much it's basically it's kind of a combination of astrology and it uses i ching and the chakras and the idea is that our souls got called to earth school and they're super excited because that's getting called to the big time. So they get the earth, call, earth school call and then they decide they get to choose a purpose. So they pick out their purpose and then they pick out the way they want to complete the purpose and they pick out a type and they also pick out other things like whether we're specific manifestors or general manifestors, whether they, we like routine or don't like routine. And in reading my, human design chart, which took a while because the first time I saw it, I was like, what is this? It just, it makes no sense. <laughs> and then 
And then I learned that my type, which is a manifesting generator, is otherwise known as a warrior Buddha. And I was like, oh, okay, Bigger. that resonates a lot. And eventually I found some, some other sources and yeah, now I know. Manifesting generators, we are here to play. We're here to do all the things, to zig and zag and be hyphenated. And so it might be called ENFP, it might be called having ADHD, or I'm a manifesting generator and I'm here to play and space and time are not my jam. I'm here to play and show the world that it's not just a straight line. So when I was digging into my chart, my purpose is it's to be intuitive and to be intuitive, especially with others. It's deep connection through intuition. Hmm. And that, that was like the third place intuition showed up in my chart. And I was like, oh, okay, got it. Thanks. I was mm -hmm. leaning more into that. But now I'm seeing that that's actually what you chose for me. That's like, that's what I'm here for. I love it. That's so cool. <laughs> Can't so wait to find out more about it. Does intuition, like, so do you think everyone has the access to their own intuition and should use it or is it more like you say based on your personality type or your um human design or whatever you however you want to frame it yeah i think we all have it and you know maybe since my soul chose it it's just something i'm supposed to use i'm just it's something i'm supposed to have out loud basically mm -hmm. um it doesn't mean i'm psychic i have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow it just means uh, i like I, I get hits on things. Yeah. Uh, you're in tune. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just and right you're here. exploring that, which is cool. Like it's great to, I think it's great to actually spend time on your intuition, like ex using it and exploring it because animals, you know, we're animals at the end of the day, we've got, you know, millions of years of evolution behind us and, and there's certain things that trigger us and, and we can either push it away or we could lean into it and, and try and see what it means. And, I think there's a lot to be so much actually to be said for that stuff. So just moving forward a little bit, it's, it's, you know, you, coming from a, a, a girl, a young girl who was struggling at school and, um, you know, with learning disabilities and these kinds of things, it's a, it's impossible to skip over the fact that you, uh, a seriously clever cookie and have uh, worked as a science writer and a marine biologist and you've trained dolphins and studied killer whales in the pro uh, so i mean just you've done some amazing stuff yeah i and it, actually this gets back to the manifesting generator thing too is like we go through we go through different careers or we can but the curiosity i developed no the curiosity i was like encouraged to use as a biologist is the same curiosity i use as a coach i so finishing up college, as a varsity athlete, we got these recruitment letters from like consultants and investment bankers. I did not know what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so eventually I made my way to the career counseling and there was no guidance on what to do when you got there. There was no, there was no nothing. So like senior year, I'm just there like, hey, so what do I do here? And they're like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. That's why I'm here. And they're like, do you want to be a teacher? I majored in psychology and art history and minored in biology. And uh, do you want to be a teacher? No. Do you want to, do you want to go to med school? No. Do you want to go to vet school? And I was like, oh, I guess if I get three options, that's the one I choose. <laughs> so I went to study dolphins. What really interested me was animal behavior. And so I kind of realized I've been asking the same questions my whole life. It's just like, how do, how do people work? How do animals work? What are they doing? What are they thinking? Why are they doing that? And uh, yeah, so I went to study dolphins and dolphin behavior and be a vet intern. So I took care of the dolphin's health at the same time. Then I went on to work in an aquarium in the veterinary center. And that's where I decided I didn't want to go to vet school <laughs> because they just they ended up euthanizing so many animals and I was like, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. So from there I went to grad school and that's where I started killer whales. I did my masters on killer whales and toxins because they, the Southern resident population lives in the Pacific Northwest off the coast of Washington. And 
they're noticing these dents in their heads behind the blowhole. They're calling them peanut heads. Mm. And so it was just malnourishment. The wow. salmon stalks were going down. That's what these guys eat. And so they were losing body fat. Wow. And what happens to killer whales, especially as they lose body fat, is when they wash up on the beach, they're considered toxic waste. Because as they lose body fat, they're pulling their their body pulls the toxins from their fat into their blood. Mm. So they have been living in this ocean eating these fish and we don't take very good care of our ocean or environment they're taking in all this toxic Mm. stuff all these plastics etc and storing it in their blubber and then as they start to lose weight they pull the toxins out of their blubber into their blood and it's toxic waste so on that uplifting note yeah then i studied um then i i went on to try working in a cage and that didn't work so well. And so that's when I became a science writer because what lit me up was sharing information about science. I loved seeing people get excited when I'd share like a little factoid, sea cucumbers breathe out of their butts. Like every 10 year old boy loves that. That's like my icebreaker. (laughs) So, so I wrote fun. I, I took scientific papers and I made them fun and funny. I did that as a blog and I did that for a couple outlets and articles like magazines and stuff. And that was a lot of fun. Mm, that's so cool. That's so cool. <laughs> how, long, how long did you end up doing that for? I did that for, let's see, probably three years. And then, and I was always on the side. I was you know, working at a Y, coaching the swim team, doing personal training, teaching group fitness, all stuff I well, I, th- I knew I'd be coaching a swim team on the side, but I never thought I'd be teaching group fitness. That was every once in a while when I was teaching, I'd have these moments of like, so Kelsey, you're an aerobics teacher now? Like, what is this? <laughs> um, but I loved it. And I was always doing that on the side. And then massive, we had massive funding cuts. I got three gigs with like, big science writing outlets it was was like the big time like for me it was it was like getting called up to the equivalent of like npr bbc in my own world and then they they'd say we're gonna get you your contract next week and then next week they'd call and be like we just lost all our our, all our funding Mm -hmm. and it happened three times in a row and that's when i had started coaching triathletes Mm -hmm. and i'd noticed that they didn't it wasn't the workouts that they needed so much. It was help with like self-worth, that inner critic stuff that I was talking about. It's help with boundaries, like being able to say, no, I'm not going to work on the weekend. Mm. And that is when a friend posted on Facebook about life coaching school. And I was like, what? What is this? What is life coaching? What is life coaching school? Tell me all about it. And she told me all about it. And I was enrolled the next day. And in coaching school, I think a month or two later and knew I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Wow. That's interesting. So, so, so what age were you at um, when you started getting interest, interested in the coaching? I think I was 30, early thirties. Okay, cool, cool. And um, just, just to go back like one step um, earlier on, you were talking about your time for swimming and you said 23 seconds for 50 yards. I'm saying that's a 50 meter race. Like, Yards. You, so yards, not so. What what is that in meters then? Uh, I don't know. I'm never good with that conversion. Yards are yards and meters and meters. <laughs> uh, is it three yards? No, no. What's it? Three feet. That's feet. Meter. I'm it's sure it. it's the same distance. To be honest with you, like it's pretty close. It, I think. Yeah. It's meters are longer. Um, it's we used to say, I swam in a 25 meter pool in high school, and it was like four. Four seconds, I think, for a four seconds for a fifty. An extra four so seconds. F- so fifty yards is forty-five meters. Ah, uh, okay, cool, cool, cool. But that's still a mean time, though. To be honest with you, yeah. you said you weren't, uh, you know, a top athlete, but you were a top athlete. To be honest, with you, you've probably been a little bit humble. That's a that's a fast <laughs> time. Because <laughs> I'm against some really fast girls. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, America's known for for some. Remember, she things. was coming first as well, Gareth. So you know, until yeah. that happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that, and that is my, you know, my times ranged. Sometimes I could, it would be a very uh, like a twenty three ninety nine. I think was my PR. And nice. Yeah, well done, well. Done. So, so maybe can can you just like tell us a little bit more about you know the the side gig. Uh, that uh, that you're doing and and what you found out about the, the the boundaries exactly what do you mean by that talking about triathlon coaching yeah yeah, yeah. so i remember clients i would make them training plans and then they they'd miss like three days in a row and i was like what's up I'm like i had to work at night my boss made me do this my boss made me do this my and then i had to meet my mom and my sister for this and i was like well i don't understand you knew you had a 45 minute workout. Well, why didn't you meet them after that? Why didn't you leave early to do that? And they just had no idea what their own personal priorities were and then how to voice that. Okay. They, they felt like they were in total people, people pleasing mode. Mm. Mm. Well, they were out of touch with their own values and their own desires. Mm, the, yeah, that, that happens to so many people. Hey? And was that frustrating for you? Is that like something that inside of you was just getting like, how can I change this? What can I do? Were you problem solving for them at the time? But no, not problem solving. At the time, I was so curious about it and confused by it. Because I'm not a people pleaser. I never really had that in me. So I really, and I've, I've always been so committed to training, to my body. That's just, I have a deep connection with my body. Like maybe that's where my intuition started. I've always known. It's, it's been talking to me forever. Mm. And so maybe, I, I think I was just like super curious. Like, wait, I don't understand what what can I do differently so you do the workout? Do you want to do the workout? Yeah, I want to do the workout. Do you want to get faster? Yeah, I want to get faster. Well, how are you going to get faster? I don't know. Well, are you going to do the workouts? Yeah. Oh, but my mom needed me then. And I just, yeah. I was completely perplexed by it. Incongruencies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm still perplexed by it, actually, when <laughs> I have a conversation with someone. <laughs> and I guess, um, you know, some of those incongruencies early on and then, you know, the coaching school, the, these were all like formative sort of years and times for you. But there was a time in, in coaching school when you were um, all invited to discover your inner critic and uh, actually tears were pouring down your face as you realized that your inner critic had been sort of telling you that you weren't worthy, worthy for, for many years. Yeah, this was our, in our first weekend, no, second weekend of coaching. So it was a like three in-person weekends and then tons of remote work. And our second in-person weekend was our time to do the full inner critic process. And it was a like teary mess for, there's like, I feel like the rug, the carpet in that room must have been wet from tears. Cause everyone, as you realize this voice you've been carrying around with you for your whole life, that's been protecting you. And now you're ready to release it. Wow. That is, it's such a transformative process. And it's now something I love doing with my clients. But yeah, I realized that's where I realized that my, my inner critic had been saying, you're not worthy. So, so, so what is the process? Well, like, can you just give us like an idea of what kind of, you know, the yeah. people listening, maybe they like thinking, how do I know if, if I'm like super critical on myself? Anything that you're saying that's, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough, whatever it is, that's your inner critic. And if you haven't heard, if you haven't done the work on it and you haven't heard it for a while, then do something that scares you and see if it pipes up then. <laughs> and then when you transform it, you tr so it's been trying to protect you all this time. Like I said, like it's saying, oh, it's okay. I know I'm fat. So if somebody else calls me fat, I got this. 
So it's been trying really hard to protect you. So to transform it, you help, you give it a new job. You mm. let it be on your team. Like, oh, you know how you can protect me? You can protect me by telling me I'm awesome or whatever the choice is for the person. But you bring it on to your team. Mine became a toddler. He's a little superhero. He wears a cape and he flies. He hangs out with me. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, give, him a, give him a little character or her little character yeah. And, and, yeah. and have a little talk to them when, when things get a little bit tough and then, uh, yeah, work your way yeah. through it together, I guess. When we do this, people really seem to care about, well, the inner critics really care about their outfits. So I'm, <laughs> you know, I make sure to ask people, like, well, ask it what it wants to wear. Not, I mean, I've had people be like, she wants to wear a pink leopard print skirt and um, she'll carry a pom-poms. <laughs> Very so, specific. So, so how does the inner critic differ to things like fear and the, the monkey mind and these sort of things? It's kind of, it's all combined. Fear, fear is usually of something, well, we can be afraid of our own greatness as I basically was. That's what feeling like we're not worthy is. Um, but then there's a good time of, type of fear, like you're scared of stepping in front of a bus. We want to keep that fear. That keeps <laughs> yes. us alive. Mm. That's good fear. Um, monkey mind, yeah, your inner critic is in there. It's all up in there. So when we focus just on mindfulness, we can hear it. We can hear it so clearly. If you start listening, really listening to the chatter going on in your mind, oof, there's a lot going on in there all mm. the time. So transforming the inner critic gives you, you know, you're changing that chatter. And then so with further mindfulness work, you don't hear the chatter so much. Mm. So it's reframing the, the sort of, the language within your own, within that voice and using it to empower you actually. So that, yeah, I love yeah. that. It's, it's, it's not just pushing it away. You're actually looking at it, facing it, and then engaging with it to, to turn it into something that you can use as fuel. Yeah. Cause how crappy is it that we have this voice in our head that's telling us we're not good enough. Mm. We, uh, you know, maybe you're hearing that from outside yourself and that's one thing. And if you are hearing it from outside yourself and you're not a little kid, you're probably going to walk away from it. You're going to be like, I don't want this. This doesn't make me feel good. But when it's happening in your own head, you can feel kind of trapped. Mm. So we transform that because, hey, this is the only mind you get on this go around. So let's, let's make it say positive things. Let's make it cheer you on. Sure. Yeah, really, really important. And uh, we actually had um, we had Seth Godin on our podcast quite a while back, and uh, he was talking more about like fear and things like that. And he's like, when when fear comes up, you know, you mustn't you must acknowledge it, and you must basically go, cool, I see you, and dance with fear rather than kind of let it stop you from doing things. And I always thought that was a nice way of like dealing with anything like self-doubt or inner critic or anything going cool i see you come let's have a dance and do this together and it was a quite a nice yeah. analogy yeah we ignoring ignoring it doesn't work mm. i love elizabeth gilbert's description in big magic she says fear you can come on the road trip but you're sitting in the back seat <laughs> and i'm strapping you in and you can't touch the radio <laughs> like fear right, come right. along like, I need you in case I am tempted to step in front of a bus. Mm. I need you to be there to scare me. I need you to help me see what is scary. And then there's the other kind of fear that's not the jumping in front of the bus kind, but just the, oh, that scares me a little bit. So, yes, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, yes. And also yeah. you can use that fear as a, a sort of a, if you, if you are intuitive and you are connected to your body and your your inner workings, you can use it as a, a trigger or a, 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 a you realize that you you going into territory where you should be going because it's giving you that signal and, and that can once again be used as a positive if oh i felt a bit of fear there this is probably really good yeah absolutely 
Yeah, yeah for sure. So, so um, talking about fear and, and not being fearful and in, in, uh, in 2016, so a few years ago, you decided to sell up your house in Maine, got yourself a camper van with your husband and you're like, Woo, we are going to travel around America. And you did that for like 16 months. I mean, it sounds like an absolute incredible ch- uh, trip. What kind of prompted that? And <laughs> can you please tell us more about it? It just sounds epic. <laughs> yeah. So it was three years ago yesterday, I think, that we put our house mm-hmm. on the market. And that was what I call a holy shit moment. <laughs> that comes from my first and only, right, as of now, skydiving experience, where I found that standing in the door the only thing I could think was, holy shit. And then once you're actually out in the air, there was no, that, that was gone. But you have to push through the holy shit to get to the other side. So actually putting the sign up to that saying our house was for sale was a holy shit moment. And so what we, so we lived in Maine, which is cold and beautiful and rural. And we were done. And it was partly because we wanted to live someplace warmer. I, I, one key memory I have is running in Maine in the winter and my nose was running because it was cold because I swam in an overchlorinated pool. So I'm wiping my nose on my fleece mittens. And at one point I was like, oh, and I looked down and there was red on my mitten. Oh, I just cut my nose on frozen snot. No way. That's, no way. That's gross. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was like, I don't need to do this. I don't need to. I don't need to live here. Um, so that, that was one of the defining moments of let's live someplace warmer. So the year before we had bought the camper and we took off for three months trying to figure out where we wanted to live. We thought it was North Carolina, South Carolina. We tried really hard to make those work, but they didn't. We kept finding ourselves in Florida and we settled on Jupiter, Florida, which is on the East coast. It had a gorgeous dog beach. Like that was really it big (laughs) selling point and so when we sold our house we were like we're gonna go down to jupiter and we looked at rentals and those were really pricey and we're like well we've got the camper why don't we just we're perfectly happy staying in the camper for a while so we're gonna go stay in the campground in jupiter we took our time adventuring on the way down there and we pulled into the campground and intuition i was we were there for like not even three minutes and i was like nope what (laughs) nope, this isn't, we're not supposed to be here. We Mm -hmm. stayed less than 24 hours. It also was a sketchy campground and their bathrooms were out of order. So we used that as our excuse. That's how we got out of the two month uh, reservation we'd made. (laughs) And I was like, we're we're here to be nomadic. We're supposed to travel. Mm -hmm. So we traveled all over the place right after that. Like the first the first few weeks, there was a lot of, what are we doing? Yeah. We were essentially kind of homeless. Or, I mean, this is our home. So where are we going to live? <laughs> what are we doing? And we would go through, eventually, the, the space between times when we'd be like, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? would get longer and we'd just be present and in the adventure and loving it. I, I learned that I really, truly love going someplace for the first time. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't understand how one place can be exciting and one place can be boring. That doesn't make sense to me. If I've never been there, it's exciting. And I mm-hmm. love it. I would get such a kick out of different campgrounds. Like so there was one campground at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, that they were always blasting music in the bathrooms that amused me so much <laughs> cool. and it was like a full-on dance party it's usually like 90s music and yeah if you're in there by yourself you're just like sweet this total dance party moment and that campground actually we also had a duck lay an egg under our camper wow we were really worried about because we were leaving and but something got to the egg before ah. before we left but we just had so many adventures we And eventually, we thought we knew where we wanted to live. We thought Greenville, South Carolina. It's a big place. A lot of triathletes are loving living there. And it's really pretty in the mountains. And so we, after going out west, we went out to Arizona for a while and came back and 
we're like, we're going to Greenville. And we even met with a realtor. And it wasn't going quickly. Nothing was going quickly. And I remember one day, there were a bunch of different pools to choose from. And I was swimming in one pool. And I was like, oh, I guess I could handle swimming here as my main pool. And, and then I heard that thought in my head and was like, wait, what? We're doing this adventure because we get to choose where we want to live. It's not an, I guess I can handle swimming in that pool. Yeah. And that's when I realized that we were trying to rationalize this whole city, that it wasn't for us, that in fact, we needed the ocean. We're not, if you have to, if we're living in a place where we have to choose mountains or ocean, we're going to choose ocean. Mm. Then we just headed out to the coast and again said, now what? (laughs) And it was, you know, we had initially asked the universe, we want to live someplace with warm air, warm water. We want to feel connected. We want to feel expansive. We just want the next right place. And the universe served it up. The universe was was really sassy. And (laughs) I mean, we went so many places and had so many great experiences and had a lot of what I call like this, but not this moments of, for instance, Myrtle Beach, beautiful beach. The actual town It's not a town. It's a, I have no idea what words to use. It's not where we wanted to live. Um, (laughs) And then like the pool was not very nice and far away and there weren't any safe places. You had to go drive an hour away to find a safe place to bike. I was like, no, this isn't it. I really want to be able to swim, bike and run safely and easily from where we live. And so eventually we came down to Sarasota, Florida for a race. It was a draft legal race, my first draft legal race. And I crashed on the first loop of the bike Mm. and like full on one, my front wheel on the one side of the road, bike on the other side, I was in the middle, whole lot of blood. I was out of the race and we stuck around here for a while and I met some healers and met an acupuncturist, met a great chiropractor. And so I was like, oh, well, there's some great healers in this area. That's really good to know. My husband still wanted to check out the East coast. So we went over to the East coast and there where we find healers here on the East Coast, we went into a restaurant and I immediately was like, nope, I don't like the energy here. And of course, like you need more than just the energy. And then my husband went to a business meeting and he saw accidents all over the place on the highway, total road rage. And I was like, maybe you're right about the wow. energy. <laughs> so he, that's when we came back to Sarasota and we're like, yeah, this is it. The universe had essentially been guiding us here the whole time, but it, we had to go through all those other places. We had to experience it all mm. and ride the wave. Yeah. yeah. It's re- it, it, you go, Matt. No, no, I was going to say, it's just like almost like similar to when you were younger, just trying so many different things, be cu- being super curious of different places. And then you, you eventually just like your heart and your intuition and all these things you'd been kind of cultivating and working on led you down that that specific path which um it just resonated with you at the end and there's a cool saying i heard the other day it's something like when you take one step the universe takes two you know like you you made the effort to go ahead and do that and uh, yeah the universe had your back you know yeah i completely believe in that we should we take inspired action and the universe is like all right we're doing this all right mm-hmm. i'm here i'm gonna show you and so it worked pretty hard in Greenville to show us this is not the place. Yeah. And it's interesting what you say about like your intuition and you going, no, this is, this is definitely not the place. <laughs> we just had this lady on our podcast, Alexis Ray, and she's like, unless it's a big yes, then the answer is no. And you're like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can kind of get that. You know what I mean? So like, you know, and, like, and when you guys are, I guess, arrived in Sarasota, that's what it was. It was a big yes. And you're like, cool. Going Although it wasn't, it wasn't a big yes. Okay. It was a yes, which was, I, we were looking for a big yes. Mm. And I think sometimes the yes just isn't as big as you think it is. It's more of a grounded yes. Mm. Of course. And, and were you guys, were you guys actually working at that stage like while you were traveling or were you you know yeah i started the find your awesome podcast from the camper with while hotspotting for wi-fi and 
Um, I was coaching full time. I was training regularly, although the training was, I was still training regularly, but most of my bike workouts were on the trainer because it would be tricky to find if we were only in a place for a week or less, it was too tricky to find bike routes. And that's another piece of it is going to a different pool all the time, trying to figure stuff out. I wasn't jumping in with master's groups. So it was just easier for me to find a pool, find out the hours, find out how much I owed and figure out how to get there. And it's interesting how much energy that takes, how much like you're doing something brand new, you're doing it for the first time. And we forget as humans, how just that, that fear, that underlying fear of doing something for the first time. So every week or so I was going to a brand new pool, like, and I was doing other things for the first time, but this is just a good example. It's going to a brand new pool. And it was just, it's scary to do something for the first time. This isn't like scary, like I'm getting attacked by zombies, scary. It's scary in that there's some resistance. And I, I really like to celebrate fear. I like to acknowledge, what do you do? What did you do today that scared you? And by scared you, I meant like, what did you do? Did you really want to make that phone call? Was there a part of you that was like, eh, I don't want to. Mm. And you did it anyway. Awesome. You did it. And you were scared. And I, the more we do stuff like that, it's a, it's a practice. The braver we get, the more that shows up in the big things. When things get really scary, when we do get attacked by zombies, we're totally ready. <laughs> And just before we move on to, you know, like your, your podcast and that kind of thing, uh, I was just wondering, like, that you lived that life in the van for van life for some time. Did you take home like some form of like minimalism in your life now from that? Yeah. When we first moved into our house, we are all of our stuff, which we'd put in storage in Maine was still, it took two weeks to get here. So we moved in here and we had what we had in the camper. We had two plates, two bowls, two forks, two knives, two spoons, uh, like two pots. We had just the clothes we had had in a camper. And this place was so spacious. And then the day that the truck arrived, we have a lanai that closes off. And so I went out in the lanai with my husband or with my dog, my husband basically told the movers where to put stuff. Cause I was like, none of it. I don't want any of it. He was like, oh, so we need some of it. I was like, okay. We had our mattress in the camper even. So that was in, I was like, okay, the bed frame, the headboard. And he was like, no, you need to keep some other stuff. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, put it all in the garage. I don't want any of it. I had a complete rejection of stuff. And I still, right. there's a lot of, a lot of people love swag. People talk about like race swag and even race awards and stuff. And I look at it, I'm like, where can I, who can I give this to? Like, mm -hmm. I, do, I know this will mean something to someone. I'll give it to them because mm -hmm. yeah, minimalism definitely took hold. It's been a slow, slow process of us being like, so I guess, I guess we should put some stuff on the walls. <laughs> yeah. I guess when, we when make we this look like a house. When we moved from, from the Netherlands to Australia, we did the exact same thing when the, before the container arrived, it was like such a learning lesson of like minimalism as well. And when it did arrive, I had the exact same thing as you. I was like, Oh, what, why? Like you don't need this stuff. You know what I mean? And it's such a great thing to, to have that reset. And I think we, you know, it's actually not a bad idea just to go through that exercise just for that purpose alone, you know? Yes. We had been without that stuff for 16 months. I was like, we don't need any of it. Mm -hmm. Like some kitchen stuff. Okay. It'll be nice to have, but if I was fine without it for 16 months, I don't need it now. Totally. Yeah. It's super true. Yeah. It's amazing how much like kind of baggage, I guess, stuff actually um, puts on us, you know what I mean? Like, or stress or whatever. And we don't even realize it, but, uh, but it actually does. And when you, when you get rid of stuff, it's like, really just like opens you up like as a person you're like wow i didn't actually realize that this stuff was just had such a massive impact on me yeah i think we're we're really tricky when it comes to gifts like oh someone put thought into that and gave it to me 
And I used to feel that like my mom would buy me clothes and I'd be like, my mom gave me that. And then one day I was wearing something that she gave me and she was like, that's a nice shirt. Where'd you get that? And I was like, you gave it to me. But wait a second, you don't remember. (laughs) That means you don't remember any of that stuff. And therefore I can get rid of it. Not that I didn't, I loved it at the time, but I just, to release it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. My uh, girlfriend and I, we're moving to Portugal soon and we're actually, we've been in London for like 20 years and going to just sell everything like that's it. Go there and uh, yeah, just start afresh. You know, we will get stuff like, but, but really we're quite minimalistic anyway and um, just get what we basically need when we're there. So I'm looking forward to that actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so talking a bit about your podcast, um, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your podcast, what it's about, but also, you know, for people that are wanting to start a podcast, you started yours from a camper van, um, which is a real like small little place. I can imagine you didn't have like all the like equipment that you need and stuff like people think you need, should I say? Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about like how you started it, what you used, and then what it's about. If you don't mind. Yeah. So I. After coaching school, I was having all these amazing conversations with mostly fellow coaches. And we'd get to the end of the conversation. I'd be like, we should have recorded this. Mm-hmm. And it was like probably a year or so of that. And then a year of me being like, I want to start a podcast. And then mm-hmm. finally being like, I'm going to start one, but we're in the camper. Can I do it from here? And then just deciding to go for it. And yeah, like I said, using hotspot for Wi-Fi, not particularly reliable. Use my headphones from my computer as my mic. And I recorded over Zoom. And it wasn't, it was still a year later that I bought myself a, like a real microphone. That real microphone lasted, I think, maybe two weeks before and this microphone the only way i can tell it works is it has a red light the, otherwise there's <laughs> nothing else you, you just plug it in and it works and i probably continued using it for because the red light would be on but then it would go off i probably used it for another month before i was like hold on a second <laughs> this isn't working so i returned it and they, like they they exchanged it for me but I mean, my equipment is totally minimal. I don't have a recording studio here. It's all about the conversation for me. Yeah, it's so true. I think so many people that are getting into podcasting want to make it perfect from the get go. And I know certainly with our podcast, um, we've learned that you kind of fail forward, if you want to call it that, or you learn as you go. You, And it is at the end of the day, all about the content. People People are not just fixated on what mic you have and how amazing your voice sounds. It's like, what are you talking about? Is it meaningful? Is it adding value? And I think it's a massive lesson that you obviously took as well from that. Yeah. You know, I've listened to a couple of podcasts where the audio sounds really bad and I notice it for the first minute or so, and then I get used to it. Mm. I don't, you know, I don't really care. I'm also when it comes to anything like that, like my husband will be like, let's go watch this movie in surround sound. Wasn't that amazing? And I'm like, I didn't notice. <laughs> uh, classic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kelsey, you, you, you're actually still um, quite a sort of competitive athlete and, uh, and how, how has that actually helped you with your mindset and overall sort of well being in life? triathlon is my play i love it and i notice that it feeds my it feeds my business too talking about being a manifesting generator the hyphenated people we're like when i'm in off season and i'm just doing easy rides and runs i'm not so inspired in my business but then we start throwing in some intervals and i'm like all right let's do this I learn, I learn through my body. So, you know, like self-sabotage, you can see that in so many different places in your life. You know where you can see it really quickly when you're doing intervals on the bike, like max effort intervals, and it's say number five and you're like, oh, well, I nailed the first four. 
it totally, you know, it's okay if I don't hit that one. What? I call that the self-sabotage van, which is like a total, mm -hmm. it's a windowless van that drives around in your head and we run after it. Like it's the ice cream truck, but no, 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 that's a don't, that's a no go tell van. You do not get in that one. We like grab onto the door handle and we're like, Oh, come on, you're my savior. But really the key is letting it go, seeing it and being like, Oh, I see you're circling me. I'm not getting in that today. I see the opportunity for self-sabotage, but I'm not going to take it. Hmm. Yeah, I learned so much about myself through sport. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. And, and did you have um, uh, some gut health that you also had to work through, some issues around that? Yeah. So whether it was being an ear infection kid, being on the pill for a long time, um, swimming in some questionable i did one summer of racing where i swam in the thames and i swam in the hudson river in new york and i swam in some other rivers that like aren't really known for their cleanliness and i'm like oh that could have been it too but i when i went off the pill i got it was just like my gut was not okay all of a sudden i was intolerant to all foods not all foods but it felt like that it felt like throughout the day, I would just get more and more bloated. And I was like, I don't understand what to do. And I worked with a very good friend of mine to help heal SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And she gave me so much more than recipes or tips on handling it. She's, one thing she said to me that was so brilliant early on, it was probably in April of, uh, I don't know, 2016. She said, I, I was like, Elizabeth, how long is this going to take? And she was like, what would it, how would you feel if I told you you'd be healed by August? And I was like, oh, that would be great. She was like, I don't know when you're going to be healed. But <laughs> just having that deadline, like, well, not deadline, but like kind of timeline, having something I could grab onto it was such an interesting practice of, oh, sometimes we just, when we feel totally lost and like we have nothing, we just want to grab onto something mm. just to like, like, it's like a life raft raft. I just want to rest on this for a little while. And that was not you know, that was a really interesting experience. And, and it happened after I had a tibial stress fracture and then I had a foot stress fracture and then I had pneumonia, hmm. those three, and I had pneumonia for eight weeks. I wasn't like a one week, take your antibiotics and you're all good kind of person. Cause when I, I, I go all in. Um, so I, that was all 15 months. And then it was like six months after all of that, that I started healing my gut. So I wow. think that whole process had actually prepped me to do the deep work that it requires to heal your gut. Yeah. Well, what I often see with people, uh, I'm actually a chiropractor, so I also see people that are going through all of this kind of stuff. Often your body will just eventually start to talk to you so loudly that you just have to make those choices and see someone or do something. And that sounds like you had the same thing, but you know, the gut health spe specifically is, is so interesting. Like, um, you know, it, it, just for your general well-being, your mindset, your focus, people don't always realize that there's a massive link there. And, yeah. and the other thing that people don't always realize with healing is that it is non-linear, you know, like it's not a, a time frame thing is so hard when you're dealing with it. Like, you know, how, how long does a bone take to heal? How long, you know, it's, you don't know, like everyone is so different and it's, and it's certainly not just this from A to B um, easy road necessarily. And I think it's just a, it's like a metaphor for life. You have to keep working at it and, and investing time and effort and money into your health specifically to make you a better person in other areas too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I learned so much from that healing experience and from every other healing experience, like with pneumonia, having it for so long, I remember Eventually I was back to swimming at the back of the lane and because I was in Maine at the time and we had an outdoor pool for like eight weeks and I was like, I'm, there's only four weeks left. I'm not going to miss the only sunshine time. 
And so I remember I swam with a doctor and I was like, Jody, how long am I going to have this? And she was like, Kelsey, people die from it. Mm. Like, All right. Mm. Gratitude, 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 gratitude. Mm. You get back to gratitude. Totally. You're present. Mm. So you were swimming when you had pneumonia. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, not, I was done coughing. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Mostly. I was mo- like the death rattle was definitely gone. <laughs> the death <Yeah>. rattle. <laughs> and I was off the antibiotics. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it took me to start feeling like myself. It took eight weeks. Mm, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's always a good reminder, I think, that rest is so important. Like people just underestimate, you know what I mean, how important rest is. And the, it, even if we are that sort of competitive type and we like being fit and stuff, we, we, we still need to rein ourselves in um, and realize actually we've, we've kind of got the rest of our life anyway to train. So if I miss today and I miss tomorrow, it's not really a big deal, but that takes discipline and it takes, um, yeah, just takes some control, I think. And um, it's not always that easy though for some people. Yeah, I, I have a triathlon coach and one of the reasons is because I, like I said, triathlon is play for me. Mm-hmm. So same reason if, if I didn't have a strength coach with a very specific strength workout to do every time I go to the gym, I'd just go in and play. Mm-hmm. I'd be in there for like three hours and be like, oops, <laughs> <laughs> didn't need to do all that. I, I sometimes people think like you have a coach to push you harder. I do. I also have a coach to rein me in, to tell me today is an easy day. And pneumonia mm-hmm. helped me run really slowly, like do things really slowly, really mm-hmm. slowly, really, really slowly. Because <laughs> early on in pneumonia, I was I was rehabbing my calves still, and I was like, oh, I, you know, probably a few days into having antibiotics, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna do calf raises today. And I did, and I'd been doing calf raises like this exercise for like two years. I was so sore afterwards because my body was putting so much work into healing me from pneumonia that it was like, we have no resources to help you heal the teeny tiny tears you just made by doing like 10 calf raises. All right, you're on your own. (laughs) So, so, so just moving on a little bit, um, we, we talk uh, in terms of our podcast and lessons and stuff that, uh, you know, that have sort of come up is that, that we say it's so important to talk about your story and say your story. And, and you also, you, you sort of term it slightly differently. You, said, you say, remember who you are. Why are these things so important? Oh, because we are all here. I really, truly really believe we're all here to change the world. And we're all here, we're all completely different. And who we are is light and love. Who Our natural state is joy. And it's like, you know, hashtag adulting. We forget all of that. So many people go to jobs they hate. They, they feel like they can't leave them. They're in relationships that don't set their souls on fire. They feel their whole description of their day is... I have to do this. I have to do this. You hear people talking in line about, it's just one complaint. They're just complaining together. When we remember who we are, we remember how supported we are by the universe. We remember that like, we're not supposed to know what we're doing. We're like our soul made these decisions for us. That's the human design gives us that piece. And we're just here to figure it out as we go along. We're here to experiment. We can't screw this up. Yeah. We, yeah, it's so true. Give give yourself permission to just live and be and do and and yeah, it's such a it's a great reminder and I guess gratitude also like flows into that somewhere, you know, like remember what you have, remember what the things you do really thrive at and are, you know, doing well at in your life and it's such a great reminder, isn't it? Yeah, there's a quote um, I've seen it around the triathlon community. It's like, there will be a day when I cannot do that. Do this. Today is not that day. Hmm. And that's such a good reminder for everything in our lives. There will be a day I can't do this. Today hmm. is not that day. So I'm going to do it. Hmm. 
It's totally. really I, yeah. powerful. Yeah. It is very powerful. I, I actually, I always like actually say that to myself in, in uh, many instances, you know, like, so for example, if, if, if I'm like, cause I live in London. So if I'm going, yeah, I see the stairs on the tube or I can take the escalator or the stairs basically, you know, and I'm like, there's going to be one day in my life, you know, I might be 80 or whatever the age is where I will not be able to take these stairs. And I will wish that I can take these stairs. Mm. So I must take them today for that, for that person in the future that's going to wish that they could do it. You know what I mean? Rather than kind of just be a little bit lazy and stand down on the escalator and go up because you have to think about your life. I think you have to be strategic in how you think about your life. You know, like, um, not, you know, to, you don't have to be like super regimented about it, but I still think it is important to think about your future self and how they're going to, um, reflect on some of these moments. And, um, you know, you don't want to have regret as well. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I believe in, I think there's, it's called memento mori is a reminder that we're all going to die. That can feel really morbid and I'm not into it from that perspective necessarily because I, if I found out I was going to die tomorrow, I would just go hug my husband and my dog and not really want to do anything else. But if I think of this might be the last time I, you know, I'm biking and I'm like, this might be the last time I'm going down this trail. You know, that could be because I'm going to die. It could be because our tornado is going to come in and take out the whole trail. Like who knows? But that, when we do that, when I do that, things get brighter. Like the, the flowers on the trees right. pop a little more. And I think that's, it's really important to remember that we, we're not in charge of the timeline. Totally. I do the same thing. I have this personal rule. My dog is 12 and a half now. And whenever he asks me to play, I say, yes, I will stop hmm. what I'm doing. And go play with him because cool. one day he's not going to ask me to play. Mm, yeah. He's not going to be there. That's so true. It's like just another way of framing it that I often think of is like the thing that you're doing that you never know when it's the last time. You just, you don't know. Like there will, it, there will always be a last time of everything. The last time yeah. that you send an email, you, you don't know when that is, which was your last email you ever sent in your life. Or, you know, you can extrapolate that into every little thing in your life. And uh, yeah, you can really take sad. it to a much less morbid place. Like yeah. the last time I ate gluten, like I didn't, I didn't actually document that moment, but that's yeah. You never knew that would be your last one. Right. You know what I mean? It was and, my last uh, but, piece of wheat <laughs> flour bread. <laughs> Exactly. But it's, but it's, uh, I think it, as you said in the beginning, it's like kind of, you could use it as a real positive thing in your life as a, you know, mm -hmm. just having the, that reflection, knowing that that is a reality. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really good. So, you know, talking about, you know, strategies for life, uh, you, you know, you've spoken about your inner critic. Are you, do you still like see that there in your background? Does it still come up inside of you or have you kind of totally, as you mentioned earlier, transform the way it affects you. I've completely transformed it. Sometimes, so the physical feeling we get from our inner critic is it's like we're going to cry, scream, jump up and down, dance, hide under a rock all at the same time. And did I say throw up? Because that's in there too. <laughs> like just this physical wave of like, yeah, like super squirminess. I can see it when it happens to people. And sometimes I'll get a little bit of that, but I don't get the chatter in my head at all anymore. It's mm, great. Yeah, that's great. It's a nice, it's a nice change. That's for sure. And um, one of the things you talk about in your coaching, and it's obviously like this, this word keeps on repeating itself and in, in all your stuff is, is awesome. And you say that everyone has awesome in them. So like, how do you get people to believe and find out what their awesome is? So that's part of remembering who you are. We're all born with this unique spark and that's our gift to the world. It's completely different for all of us. And I think that we're born knowing what it is, but we don't have the language skills yet to do anything with it. We don't have the physical skills to do anything with it yet. So by the time we are, we have the intelligence and the skills and all that to do something with it, 
we have been so conditioned by so many people telling us that we're not worthy, that we are supposed to work a nine to five job, that we're supposed to go to med school or law school or do that. We're supposed to make this much money, have this many kids. We've got so much of that. And I picture it like putting on layers of clothes and we're just like, our Austin is under there and we're wearing 200 t-shirts on top. Mm -hmm. We got to cut that off. Like you're going to be able to move a lot more comfortably once you can, once you're not restricted in all those t-shirts and just let it shine. It's in some sense, it's like, let your inner freak flag shine. I've seen people (laughs) post stuff like that. Like we are all total weirdos. And if you want to look at it that way, I just look at it like we are all, we have within us this unique spark, this inner genius, this inner brilliance, and that is our awesome. And we are here to share that with the world. The world needs it. The world is waiting for it. The world is craving it from us. And it's our, our gift to give it to them. It is. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it, it's, it gives people permission. We've often spoken about when someone else does that and says those words and, you know, that's, that's such a freeing thing. And, um, you know, to be awesome, it also deter, or it also requires a certain amount of energy. And we've, you know, Gareth and I have been speaking about this quite a lot lately, but, you know, in your energy management is, is actually super important off the back of that, I'd imagine. And, this is actually something that you've kind of studied and, and gone down, down into that road, haven't you? Yeah. So one of the things I work with with my clients is energy, energy levels is what it specifically is. And that's that there are, there are these different ways that we can show up in any situation. And again, I think of this, this is funny, like I'm not a big fashion person, but I think of this as trying on different outfits. Um, so you can wear the victim outfit, the woe is me. You can, and, and I call this one is being in the cat box and it's a rolling around in the kitty litter then, or you can try on the, I'm going to be super pissy, be angry. There's a right way and a wrong way. And I'm going to be right. Everyone else is going to be wrong. Yeah. And then you're in the cat box throwing poop. Or you can come on up and you can start rationalizing stuff. You can forgive people. You can let it go. You can tolerate stuff. Like a lot of people tolerate having a lot of stuff around them. And then you can try on the outfit that's all about giving to other people. It's love and it's fixing people and fixing situations. And then you can try on the outfit where, oh, people aren't broken. The people instead you empower people and you see an opportunity in everything and you want everything to be a win-win experience for everyone involved. And then you can try on the outfit that's we're all in this together. This is a process. And then you can try on flow. Like we were talking about early on driving to work. You don't really remember it, but it happens when you say brilliant things, it's just flow. And that that one outfit, you're not going to remember it because we're in total flow. So we always have a choice. When we find ourselves wallowing around and rolling around in the kitty litter, we can choose. Is this serving me right now? Is this where I want to be? Is this working for me? And it, that space does allow us to ask for help and receive help. I use that after a bike crash, that crash at the draft legal race that got us to Sarasota. Two weeks after the crash, I got this intense nerve pain in my shoulder. And it was the kind of pain where I couldn't think anything other than pain, 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 pain. And so I was definitely in that rolling around in the kitty litter space. And I used it. I used it to ask for help. I used it to get an emergency chiropractor appointment. And I used it to get, um, well, to say yes to a performance coach, someone. I was like, I need somebody with the same certifications as me. I don't, I can't really effectively coach myself, but I need me to coach me. And I found somebody with the exact same credentials who was looking to coach. I was like, please help me. 
get through this on the recovery from this crash. So it can, every, every one of those levels, every one of those outfits helps us. Everyone has a, like, there's a right time to use it and a time when it's not serving you. And when it's not serving you, you get to choose one of the other ones. Hmm. So do you have, choices. yeah. Do you have any like other sort of practical tools or bits of advice for people to manage their energy, say like on a daily basis? Mm. Just be present, be right here. I mean, I'm sure everyone has heard this. Like when you're looking at the past, you're probably beating yourself up about it. Don't do that. And, when, and this isn't helpful saying, just don't do it. When you're looking for the, towards the future, like you're going to be rushing towards it. That's where you're going to feel anxiety. Stay right here. Ask yourself what is true. What is real? And if you're sitting right now, feel, you're going to take off your foot prisms if you're wearing them, feel the ground underneath your feet. Feel like where your big toe touches the ground. Feel where your little toe touches the ground. Feel your arch. You know, maybe you feel the ground under your arch. Maybe you feel that there's a gap under your foot. Feel every edge of your heel and just notice. You can't, when you're trying to do that, you can't go off chasing. So I think of mindfulness as you're sitting by a highway watching cars go by. Your thoughts are the cars. When we're not being mindful, we're chasing the cars. And we're like sometimes grabbing the door handle. Like I said, with the self-sabotage van, we just grab onto the door handle, which is super sketchy and not safe behavior. So how about we just sit and watch the cars go by and let them go by. Mm. And then when we're being mindful, we can hear, feel every bit of our foot we can feel the jewelry that we're wearing. Feel your watch. Notice that. Notice, are you wearing rings? Notice each finger. Notice the space between your fingers. Notice the space between your toes. That's how we manage our energy. Cool. That's great. Yeah, being super present and stopping and smelling the roses is uh, always amazing advice, actually. And, and mindfulness is just, yeah, probably one of the most powerful things that we could practice day to day. And uh, so talking about um, actually being present, now I'm going to ask you a question about uh, the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are you actually planning uh, going forward over the coming weeks and months and years? And also maybe you can just let us know where people can contact you and get hold of you. That the second part of the question is a lot easier. I can tell you to go to KelseyAbbott.com and to listen to the Find Your Awesome podcast, which is available on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. What am I planning for the future? I'm going to keep going with the podcast. And I haven't, I don't think I shared this with you guys yet. I don't look at the numbers for my podcast. It's going to be two years in August of the podcast. And I started it because of these conversations. And I love the conversation so, so much. And then I love that other people get to hear it. In terms of the numbers, I know if I'm, if I let myself in there, I'm going to make up stories. I'm going to say, oh, that's not enough. Or, well, that's basically what I'm going to say. That's not good enough. So when my intention is really just to create these amazing conversations and experience these amazing conversations and then share them, the numbers aren't going to do me any good. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue doing that with the podcast. Nice. That's very cool. I think that's a great lesson for anybody in general and also especially people that are starting podcasts. Like seriously, don't let those numbers get to you, like the download numbers and stuff, because you will stop your podcast and you will bury yourself and go, I'm no good and all these sort of things because you assume that everyone is getting thousands and hundred thousands and ten thousands of downloads. But that's not the reality. Do you know what I mean? The reality is, is, is a lot less than that. Um, so I think it's an important lesson. Like in anything, you know, don't let the number of likes or comments or any of these silly things like on your posts really uh, impact you and kind of stop you from doing things because otherwise you're never going to get to share your awesome because you're going to have these things that just hold you back all the time. Uh, so that's a really important lesson. And like you said, like, you, you also, you're in this for the long run, you know, you're doing it because you enjoy it and we must do things that we enjoy. We must do more of those things. I think it's a really important lesson. Like 
Um, because otherwise, what's the point of kind of being here? We, what, what's the point of being alive if you're not enjoying things? And, and if you're here for the long run as well, um, something amazing is going to happen eventually as well, as long as you're doing consistent stuff and you're putting out good content and providing value, uh, it's going to win in the long run, no matter what. So, um, yeah, I love the way that you kind of look at it and, um, yeah, do those things. So, um, yeah. I heard once it was Mike Posner is the guy who sang cooler than me. And I took a pill in Ibiza. I heard an interview with him and he described art as you don't make it for other people. You make it like it comes from your heart and then you hope other people like it. Mm. And so with that, I was like, Oh, my podcast is art. I'm not making like the numbers would tell me maybe what other people like, but really can I tell that they like it or just that they know about it more? Um, totally. I'm just creating it to create it, to put it out in the world. Yeah. 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 And by creating you also learning and, and by doing you also create connections and, and there is, as you both mentioned, there's always that downstream effect of just doing stuff in life. And if it's giving you purpose and, you're adding value to your own life. What's more important than that? Because you become a better person, you become a more interesting person. And if that's, if that's the very least that you get out of it, then it's worth it. You know, how cool is it that we get to do this? Yeah. That yeah. The three of us are on different continents right now. They were having a conversation and that other people are going to listen to it. Like, I just think that this is really rad. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and someone's gonna get some value out of it. You know what I mean? That that's just even rarer. Like it's just so cool. Um, because I would do this if no one was gonna listen. Because I'm really enjoying this conversation. Likewise, so, yeah. I'm just in it for the conversation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, also, just the other thing of like even doing the podcast is for Craig and I at least. We just find that we've grown so much as uh, people ourselves, and we've learned so much from all our guests because everyone has something awesome and magic to share. And it's just, uh, it's just like, like such a cool, it's just an incredible opportunity to kind of sit back and go, cool. I'm going to take this and this and this and this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We get to talk to all these magical people that like I've got, so I'm at episode, episode 97. We'll drop this week. Nice. That's 96. 95 because I had two episodes with my husband. 95 people that weren't necessarily in my life before that I've learned at least one thing from. Mm. Exactly. That's pretty cool. That's freaking great. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have learned a hundred new things that are probably very powerful things. You know what I mean? Like, that's amazing. Seriously. Like, wow. Um, mm. Yeah. Cool. So, so just our last question. Um, um, before we kind of finish off. So we'd like to find out what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, I think humans are ridiculous. I love this question, by the way. I think humans are hilarious. I think that, so I can talk about all the things that our souls chose for us coming here and choosing our purpose and all that. But then we are on this planet trying to navigate just being with other humans and we are all so awkward and funny and uh, we have no idea what we're doing i really humans i think are hilarious so i think being ridiculously human is just owning the fact that we don't know what we're doing and we're hilarious we fall down all the time we just like humans are funny <laughs> humans put their feet in their mouth all the time we yeah we don't know what we're doing. Hmm. I love it. Yeah. It's so true. <laughs> yeah, I, we're I really, all like super awkward puppies. Yeah. You, <laughs> you, you, you summed it up well early on. You said we're all weirdos. And I'm like, yeah, we are all weirdos, you know, like in a cool yeah. way, you know, like uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so yeah, look, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for the chat. Um, uh, as we said, like just now, it's so, it's so cool um, just having these conversations and you, and you get so much um, from just hearing somebody else's story. And then there's, there's certain things that, that you say. And like, for me, the, the, the thing you mentioned about the souls really resonated. And I, I totally love that, uh, sort of concept. And I, it reminded me of when I was in, um, Vietnam, I was going to all these, I think they're called pagodas. Um, and, uh, the guy was talking to us, he was telling us about 
deja vu and dreams and stuff. And, and more deja vu though is like deja vu. You have it because um, in your dreams, your souls go out and play and all these sort of things. And then later on that, that sort of happens in your life. And, and that's because your soul was out playing sometimes. And that's why it, it sort of comes back to you. And I'm like, that's it. I love that. I want to be a Buddhist. Uh, if I ever choose a religion, that's me because I could, it just made so much sense to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's so cool. So when you said the thing about souls, I'm like, I totally get that. I just love it. And I, um, I can't wait to, it's a human design. Did you say I can't wait to kind yeah. of go a bit, bit deeper into that. So um, thank you for just yeah providing that perspective. And I also really loved like how you categorize things like, and you give everything these cool fun names, like, cat boxes and throwing mm -hmm. things and you know what I mean there's a, and I can't remember all of them because there are so many cool ones I was like that's cool because it, it makes it makes things fun I can imagine for your coaching clients and they're like ah oh, that's cool and then they'll remember it they'll be like oh yeah I'm in the cat box now okay <laughs> and um, that's very powerful you know it's a it's a great way to help people remember things um so yeah just thank you so much I really enjoyed speaking with you it's nice to speak with someone that has such a big smile all the time and um yeah just willing to talk about uh, you know so many things so rawly so really appreciate uh, you coming on to the podcast thank you I've had a blast you guys this is <laughs> Likewise, fantastic then. And just real briefly from my side, Kelsey, now, like Gareth, one of the things that Gareth mentioned there was also stuck for me is your analogies are really great. They're like, I'm totally like, you know, when it's an analogy is such a powerful thing and you've used them so well, you know, like I, it, it just, it just sort of goes deeper inside of you and you're like, oh yeah, that's exactly how I feel, you know? So you do a really great job of that. So, so keep using those for sure. And I also like get this major sense of adventure and, and that's, when I'm speaking to you and it's, it's such a great reminder that life is an adventure. It's okay to be weird. We don't, we are like awkward puppies, as you said, and I love that as well. Another good analogy, but we, you know, we, there is so much adventure to be had and let's go out there and remember who we are. Remember that that's adventure and fun and playfulness is part of what we're all here for. And uh, I think you do certainly bringing that to, to humanity. So thanks for that and have yourself an awesome rest of your day. Thank you. That was just the sweetest things that anyone has said to me in a really long time. I love you both. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Our pleasure. <laughs>